the 90s, you had grunge and you had hip hop. And the thing that hip hop gave people that, that no other genre gave was the sense of, I can not only make it in music, I can make it in life and make it in business. What's up everybody? Today, I am sitting here with a very dear friend of mine, as well as the CMO of Visa. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Frank Cooper. Thank you, Rich. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. I'm happy we're having this conversation. It's a long time coming. It is a long time coming. I was reading up on you. Um, it's always fun to read up on someone that I'm friends with because I get to learn certain things that I didn't know. And I, true to form, learned a lot about you. And it was interesting to me to hear a little bit about your childhood and then think about where you are today. Um, I know how my childhood shaped where I am today, but talk to me a little bit about looking at your role today in life and where you were growing up, how your parents and how where you grew up shaped who you are. Yeah, man. You know, it's, it's always hard for me to explain it because, uh, you know, I grew up in California. Um, I was born in San Francisco, but my, my coming of age years were really in L.A. It was in Carson, you know, um, as Kendrick Lamar would call it, Compton adjacent, right? <laughs> so like right over the hill. And, um, and those were my coming of age years. And so if you had asked me then, you know, could I see myself in this position, you know, um, running some of the largest brands in the world, you know, now at, you know, the 11th largest company, uh, you know, $500 billion company, um, I would never have imagined it. You know, it was not in, it was not even in the scope of what I thought was even possible. And so the time, you know, I played ball and, 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 you know, through high school and, you know, all city, all that, and all state, all, all that. So I could see that path. Um, but fortunately my, my mom had went to UC Berkeley. And she, and she didn't graduate. She spent two years there, got married, and it at least opened up that idea that, you know, I actually want to go to Berkeley. And there's some other choices, but, so, but I went to Berkeley, and that really changed the course for me. You know, once I went to Berkeley, I started to see kind of new possibilities. But growing up, um, this was never, ever. First of all, I didn't even know what marketing was. I had no idea what, yeah. what mar marketing was. Um, my idea of business um, was more around technology because that's what my dad did. So anything more entrepreneurial and, and, and technological was kind of where my head was. Oh, wow. But that wasn't really kind of my core passion, even though I do a yeah. lot of that. Um, so it took me a while just to figure out what is even possible out in the world. So first of all, let me not just like jump over all city, all state, which I didn't know when I was <laughs> reading. So you played basketball or football? Basketball. And yeah. you, you were a real guy. So, so I, played, I played basketball, um, but uh, I was at Banning High School and um, Coach Ferragamo, we, uh, they were six-time football champions like, in a row. We had a big line, you know, at the time we had the Samoan line, uh, front line. So oh, we yeah. like, were open, they were open up wide holes. So you got constantly trying to get me to play football. I didn't like that kind of contact. So <laughs> I was like, so I, I, I stayed with basketball and, um, you know, um, did well. I did well. I you know, played Daryl Strawberry, who, who's no more as a baseball player, but he was at Crenshaw playing basketball. And yeah, and, and he was uh, a serious basketball player. Serious basketball player. Yeah. Lefty, uh, you know, strong. He was very yeah. strong. Yeah. So you mentioned your mom went to school for two years. So were you the first person to graduate college in your family? I'm the first one to graduate college from my family. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and um, you know, more of now, um, my, I have some nephews and nieces that have, have graduated, uh, but first in my immediate family. That's and, amazing. And then my brother my, uh, followed after that. And you went to college with the goal of graduating or were you already kind of imagining what post-college for, for you would be like or at the beginning was it just like let me get this education that's been instilled in me let me be the first in my family no well i i always always enjoyed learning so um ever since i was really very little i, I enjoyed reading learning talking to people just just absorbing things i've always enjoyed music you know i played music professionally it was in you know bands and all recorded in studios so that kind of stuck with me those were the two things that stuck with me um but when i first went I thought I might even play basketball at Berkeley uh, until I went out to practice. And then um, there was some guy who transferred in from, from uh, City College. And uh, I think first play, he kind of, you know, head fake crossed over. And next time I was looking back, he was up at the top of the square. I had never seen that before. Second one, step back, three-pointer. It was Kevin Johnson. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what triggered it for me is I thought I, I was good at, uh, on a, to, to a certain extent. But that was like another level. And yes. I was like, that is what professional probably looks like and it's just a it was a different level different like kind of leap off the ground different totally. speed different you know it was just different and i was like it became clear to me um and because i <laughs> because i love learning say so that let me focus on that side of yeah. it yeah and 
and the, and for me, the more I learned, the more enthusiastic I got about it, the more energy I got. I got great feedback, you know, mm -hmm. from from teachers and professors along the way. Um, and it was, it became my obsession and passion. That's cool. I, it's it's amazing to hear the story about Kevin Johnson. I have a similar one. It's it's an interesting story to tell later on in life, but at the moment it, it is like very eye opening. And yeah. I had the same thing with Stefan Marbury. It was like the speed in which I saw him go by me on a court made me realize I was done playing basketball forever. Yeah, yeah, it's a messed up feeling at first, though, isn't it? it? Is. Like when you, when you first when you first see, like, wait a minute, like you know, you used to be able to like yeah. blow past people, and and, and it's just a different. different level. Yeah, you know, growing up and being like alive and young and curious in the nineties. I've realized other people like envy. I talked to young people. I went to dinner last week and two people said to me, man, I wish I was a teenager in the 90s. I wish I grew up in the 90s. And I realized that it really is like a badge of honor in some ways because we saw this like emergence of hip hop culture. We saw the globalization of sport, Michael Jordan becoming this icon around the world. But I also think it, it made certain people start to think that things were possible that were impossible. I didn't have the knack for learning. I didn't find myself focused in school. But that era and seeing some of those personalities like rise to such fame and success so quickly yeah. made me think like, man, I can follow this path a bit. For you, you grew up in California during this era too. How much of an impact at this time when you were playing ball, giving ball up, getting educated, starting your journey, were you also looking at like hip hop culture exploding and seeing these stars around the world that you just didn't know before. Yeah, 100%. I mean, look, I, mean, I had the good fortune of working at Def Jam. Like, you know, when Def Jam was actually right down the street here at 160 Varick. You know. Right after school? Right uh, after college? No, no. So after college, I, I worked for a law firm for a year. Okay. And then I went into Motown Records. And, uh, and then out in Los Angeles, earthquake hit in Northridge. We were about a mile from the epicenter. My wife, Nina, was like, you know, we get the hell out of here. But, <laughs> so I thought I was going to come to New York for just a couple of years. Because Russell, um, Russell Simmons and Leo Cohen have been calling me about coming out, and so um, so I said I'm going to come out now. So I came out for a couple. Of, I thought I'd come out for a couple of years and stayed. And I just happened to hit it at the right moment. Um, you know, we had at that time it was Montel Jordan, it was Domino. We had Month of the Man with Method Man and Red Man signed up Jay Z, Jay Z and Foxy Brown did, mm -hmm. uh, did the single uh, together. Got DMX over from um, you know, from Sony. Um, Kanye West came on board. It was a crazy what a time. time. Crazy, so crazy this is run. Mid 90s in New York? Yes, exa exactly. And it was insane. And you got to realize in the early part, there's still all the questions about will it last? Yeah. Um, but one thing that, that it did for me was um, it just reinforced the, my own entrepreneurial spirit. Because what I saw was that um, unlike the other, I think, great period in time was 70s when you had great music and a mixture of things, 80s uh, uh, um, was to me kind of a dead period in that regard. But the 90s, you had grunge and, and alternative rock and Nirvana and, and the flannel shirts happening, and you had hip-hop. And the thing that hip-hop gave people that, that no other genre gave was the sense of, I can not only make it in music, I can make it in life and make it in business. And I'm going to put it all together. Yeah. And, and there, were no, there were no stigmas uh, yeah. uh, around that. And, and so, so we lived in, in, that, in that world. And for me, that was really inspiring. I saw it from Russell's perspective in, in what he was doing as a kind of business owner. I saw it from uh, the run DMC perspective, you know, from the management side, yeah. but I also saw it from the everyday artists within Def Jam, uh, those who had that mindset of, um, hey, this is all kind of one thing. I'm performing, I'm creating value, but I'm trying to capture some of that value yeah. my, myself. And it, and it was it was unique, because you, you remember, I mean, it used yeah. to be, if an artist, if an artist would um, you know, try to be commercial, sell something, is always considered like the sellout. Yeah. No one says that word anymore. Never. We're talking about sellout. It's yeah. like, you know, it's like, you know, we are here to entertain, fulfill your passion, but to get paid. Yep, straight up. Yeah. And that the sky's the limit. And the sky's the limit. There's no there are no barriers. Yeah. Yeah. It it almost became a bit for for a lot of people like the a new American dream in some ways as a kid growing up in the nineties was that like the idea of making money, building business and then doing something you love. At the same time, it was like infectious because you're seeing Puff Daddy and, and Jay-Z and Damon Dash and Death Row and No Limit. And these were these brands that were building these followings like a sports team had. Yeah. It's, yeah, I think that's a perfect phrase, the new American dream, because what, everyone got the joke. The old American dream had died. Yep. Like, what are you going to do? You're going to get one job, 
stay there for whatever, 30 years, 40 years, whatever, at the end, get a watch and a pension. Yeah. Well, first of all, pensions were over. You know, like they, they pensions that moved to 401k plans. You're on your own. Yeah. People got that joke. The job forever? No. It was mergers, acquisitions, takeovers. No one's giving you any promises. So so the first people to get that joke was hip hop culture. Yeah. They're That's like, we are, we're already on the outside of it. <laughs> you guys are already not building any uh, structures for us, You're not getting any pathways. So I guess we're going to make our own pathway and do it in a way where we can sustain ourselves long term. Yep. I'm not saying it's perfect, by the way, because there's, there's, there's some other underlying things that actually, I think, prevent hip hop overall um, um, from being even more successful. But at least gave oh, people wait, a pathway. Tell me about that. Um, I, one, I think um, we have a hard time collaborating with each other. It's not enough trust across lines. Um, I agree there, with that. There are opportunities to partner um, across lines and build things that are even bigger. Yeah. Um, and so so that doesn't ha- happen enough. I think we don't share enough information. There's always this feeling that, I mean, I believe information is power, but most cases people don't do much with information you give them unless they already got the hustle in them, right? And so if you can share information uh, with each other, it opens up new possibilities. Like if you don't know a deal is about to go down or you don't know a merge is about to happen or you don't know that NFTs is on the rise or, um, you, know, or you don't know that um, 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 Wall Street now is putting together large funds to buy music catalog and, 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 and what that actually means, you got to figure it out yourself. And we can, I think, short circuit a lot of the trauma that happens along the way if we shared more information. That's a really, you know, it's interesting. I, I interviewed uh, Terrence Bud Crawford. Um, and right here, this exact table about maybe five, six months ago, and we were talking about, you know, he was building his own business, his promotion business, and he wants to change it. And he talked about how he's hesitant to make certain changes because even though Floyd knows that he was screwed over at times when he went and built his business, he had to play into the same rules in order for him to make money. Right. Yeah. And a lot of that is because I feel like these athletes and these entertainers, when they go on to build businesses are coming from a world in which it's always about ranking who's better. It's always about competition. Then you're asked to have them all of a sudden share secrets and partner and align. It feels against everything that they came up like ingrained in their mind. But I think it can shift because of people like Jay-Z, for instance, right? Because he's separated himself so much from the competition that for him, you know, if you're building a company and you're in basketball or hip hop, you're honored if if he wants to take you in and partner with you. But I think as people continue to grow in and you see the Rich Pauls becoming these big brands and Maverick and all these companies being built, as I go into the world now and I meet with young agents and they say, well, who, you know, who should I talk to? I said, you should talk to Rich. You should talk to Mav. Like it, it shouldn't be, now that's them. How do I chase that? There's no more chasing. It's like, how does everybody in some ways find ways to collaborate and grow the whole pot? Grow the whole pie. And, 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 and the pie is big enough already. Um, and, and no one has to actually even give up any secrets. You know, you're not giving up secrets like, hey, let me tell you about a specific deal. But if you can get, you can. There get are no s- secrets. There are no we secrets. We all know. We all know, <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah, um, but what you can share is like, what's the, the mindset, you know, that actually allows you to be successful? You know, one thing, and athletes know this very well, excellence requires help. Yeah. That's the bottom line. You're not going to, you're never going to do it on your own. So if excellence requires help. You need information. You need someone to give you guidance. You know, if you show up, like, the trick in Hollywood, uh, and, and this is true for a lot of, I'm going to say black actors in particular, the trick in Hollywood is people will, will, will respect and reward predictability over talent. So you get someone like Ludacris. Ludacris will be at the meeting an hour early. He will be sitting in the lobby waiting, ready to go, fully prepared, and everyone's going to work with, with, with Luda. There's some others that may show up, may not show up, you know, um, you know, may be prepared, may not be prepared. And the predictability is worth a lot. Yeah. And so, but someone's got to tell you that, that, um, hey, guess what? You can be the most talented individual. Um, um, you could be genius, in fact. But um, Hollywood is not going to weigh that very heavily if you don't do some of the basic stuff. Yeah. There's an etiquette to, these, to this thing. Yeah, it's a good point. And it's a shame because it's a lot of times the people that know early are the ones that could have given you the break because they know they spot the talent right like your peers know the people within the same conversation know but because of the competition they wait exactly they wait till they see you there and then you think it's not the time to go partner with them you did all this because you're now supposed to go partner with the big bank that's right as opposed to how much power you can get from partnering with each other that's right yeah 
Um, let's go to UBO, right? And I, I don't know how many people ask you about UBO, but the reason why... Not a lot I, anymore. <laughs> the reason why I'm so interested in that time is because UBO was the model amongst this like five or six hip hop startups. And I had one at the same exact time in 1998 and 99, raised a little bit of money to start this company, onelevel.com. And there was volume, oh, yeah. you remember, oh, yeah. and UBO. And, you know, we ran out of all our money in two years. I always joke that I sadly spent the majority of it on our launch party, which um, was incredibly irresponsible. But looking back on it, the lack of education I had, I made up for in those two years running that business. It was like I had just gotten my business degree and my law degree. Yeah. Um, it was a gift of an opportunity. And I look at that time and realize that at that point on, I started to understand that business, like you said in a quote I read, was meant to improve your life. And I always looked at it as something different. Like the education was to go get the job and the job was going to be a pain in the ass. And I just wanted to live my life. When in reality, now that all these opportunities were open to us and you saw this through hip hop and through sport and through that time in the 90s, it dawned on me when I did this company, business is to improve my life, is to make me feel better about myself, to have regard, to have resource, to live a better life. And it started my journey, a long one. For you, you did get an education. You did go and work for two incredible companies. But what did you learn in that startup time in your life with UBO? That that was probably the most critical moment in my entire career. Um, painful, by the way. Um, it's painful because you I mean you know the experience on paper. For a while there, we looked really good actually on paper. Like <laughs> yeah, you know, like uh, how much am I worth? Okay, you know it, it, it was actually a good moment. But um, and it was a good moment in the sense that um, you know what we were. What we were proposing at the time at UBO is that um, you know there's this kind of cultural connection among people that transcends traditional demographics. It's not based on age or gender or income uh, or ethnicity. It's based on these kind of shared values and shared heroes and shared stories and shared history. But we they were disaggregated, and so having this online presence would allow us to bring people together. That was the concept, and um, and I learned so much about myself through it. You know, we didn't get to the finish line. We even had our ticker symbol ready to go and all that. But we didn't get to the finish line. We sold off pieces of it. We had a crazy launch party, too, at Ellis Island. <laughs> crazy. It was like, yeah. you know, ridiculous. Um, that, that, those were the times. But I learned a lot about myself. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's when I actually discovered that what I actually am really good at is seeing um, how to shape people's behaviors and how to shape their perceptions. And I realized that's what marketing really is. Mm-hmm. You, know, um, you know, I realized that um, I could think strategically and creatively. And none of that really came out fully until I went through the UBO experience. Because you know this, when you're, when you're in that complete startup mode, you're, you're doing every single thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and you'll find out who you are through that. You know, you know, because it's going to be a, um, difficult, painful, you're going to push through, and you're going to find things that give you energy and things that actually sap your energy. And the things that give you energy you perk up for that. You know that's kind of where your that's that's your not only where your passion is, but probably where your talent is. And that's what I learned. So you know, it's interesting because after that, you know, I still felt like I was an entrepreneur, and what an entrepreneur meant was that I had to go and build my own thing, or I had to do my own thing. And I think that's a major misconception, and young people fall into that now more than ever. But when I think about your entrepreneurial journey from that point on from company to company. And I even interviewed David Solomon once and and it was within Goldman Sachs. And I said, to me, that's as entrepreneurial of a journey as one could take navigating the corporate ladder, the politics that are involved. And for you, different headwinds than he had to deal with in your career. You know, I think about uh, the decision to go from like being the guy, you raised all this money, you had the ticker, and then you went into the corporate world. How was that for you mentally? And do you see that in young people today too, this feeling that like, working for a company may not be the entrepreneurial journey that they had set for themselves. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I feel like you can create anywhere. And, uh, and I mean, there are going to be some environments where it's much more difficult. Um, the culture inside of a certain company may not allow you to kind of be truly innovative. Um, but my, I've always taken the perspective that wherever I am, I'm going to create. I'm going to innovate. I'm going to try to expand what's what's possible. And I've been fortunate um, in, in that I've gone to companies that have given me that, opp- that opportunity. But I also learned something. Um, there's two things I learned. Number one is you don't have to build everything from scratch. Probably, the, you know, that's the hardest thing to do. And we come out of a world where that's kind of what we felt like we had to had do. Had to do, yeah. Right? Because so, no one's going to give us anything. So you're like, okay, I'm going to build it from scratch and build it up. 
hardest thing to do. Um, but you can buy things that exist. You can buy things that are undervalued and use that as a foundation to give you momentum and build your idea right on top of that. It's a much easier play, much less risk. Um, I'm seeing more of it now, but we, I think we can do much more than that. Inside of a company, and then, you know, some people call it entrepreneurship, um, there's one thing people, most companies that are successful now realize is that they no longer can rely on their size, their dominance, their current market position. They better grow, they better evolve, and they better innovate. Mm -hmm. That's been the realization. It took a while, right? But when, when people saw Blockbuster, you know, just like get taken out. Yeah. So Tower Records get to take get get taken out. See these large companies, their stock price drop eighty percent because the environment around them has changed so much. Most companies that are, are surviving and thriving today realize you have to keep evolving and keep innovating. And so for someone like me, that's a blessing because that means that's that's what entrepreneurs do. You think of what is possible and how can you build it within this environment. But most importantly, who can I get to come along with me? Yeah. You know, because you got to you have to get a group of people, a critical mass of people to say, like, I see what you see or I believe in what you see. And then they help support you to get there. But how is a young person at a company without a voice of that magnitude who sees some of those deficiencies? How do they speak up within a corporate environment? Yeah, it's it, it, it's it's tough. I mean, if you. You need help again, um, and and so what I've tried to do um, throughout my, my entire career is find someone who would augment my voice, you know. And so um, that's num number one. Number two, I realized that in many cases the, the decisions weren't being made in the room where the decisions were supposed to be made. They were getting made far before that. And it was like a kabuki play. You get by the time you got into the room, you know, um, you know, it was people went through the motions, but it was already already decided. So. I realized that the conversations you have outside the room in trying to persuade people and putting them in a position where they're much more comfortable to have the interaction, debate, exchange, collaboration is much more, uh, uh, it's a much more successful um, path. But I, but I was also lucky, like I had, um, you know, Clarence Avant was a very, very close friend and mentor um, um, to me. And, and so in many cases, I could go to someone like Clarence and the beautiful thing about Clarence was that you know, he would never give you a euphemism, he'd never give you kind of like a kind of a soft angle in. He'll just tell you like right between the eyes, this is what it is. And and for me that was very helpful because then I had no no confusion about like, okay, how do I actually convince this leadership team that this is the right way to go? And and, and you know, he would say, Hey, it's a person that you need to do, or you need a group of people to kind of align with you, or you need to go to the CFO because that's where the money is, or you know, or you need to build it outside and show them as possible and bring it back inside. He was very clear and it was very helpful to me. Isn't it amazing how incredibly successful and confident people can be so simple and practical and they know they're right that they don't have to give you all the color? I've I've had similar interactions at my time at Rock Nation. I remember talking to Jay about Kevin's free agency. Yeah. And he was like, Warriors are the best team and Silicon Valley is where all the money is. And it's like, yeah, I know that. But I thought there was going to be more. And it's like, there's never more. Sometimes it really is just what you think. The and simplicity you, is so yeah. like, it's so, I mean, clear as the clouds, right? I mean, yeah. Like, and, and, but it seems it seems too simple, right? Yeah. yeah but it, but it, it's the best path usually. Because you feel like the simple way can only hold real weight sometimes when you feel like you've like earned the ability to to, to like state the simplicity of it, you know, but it is, it's that, that frees you a bit because the answer is a lot of times right there in front of you. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, at least for me, um, um, I think we get used to the struggle and you think that the struggle is part of the process. And, mm. and, and when someone presents something that's really simple and straightforward, doesn't feel like the struggle at all. you're like, that can't be it. <laughs> that's you know exactly I mean? it, man. Yeah. That's exactly it. You're right. So, I think about um, using that word struggle, the, the role of a CMO. Um, you know, for me, there's there's amazing things that I get to learn from building boardroom. And it was one of the reasons why I did it. I, I'm full of curiosity, you know, and, I, and there's so many blind spots from my, my early childhood because I didn't go to school. And I always felt like I was uh, trying to get through a struggle, trying to get through the next struggle that I didn't 
have much time to consume and, and retain certain things. So like when I read up on your CMO journey, it's like I'm reading up on this for the first time. And, it, and it's powerful, even in my age, to learn this information. So I learned about your roles, you know, going from AOL to, let me see if I get this right without looking, AOL, uh, Pepsi, then you went to BuzzFeed, yeah, and then BlackRock. Yeah. Boom. Look at you that memory. You Look got at that it. memory. Yeah. Um, but the role of a CMO is one that historically is for these terms, right? Where you don't stay at these companies for 20, 30, 40 years, or that's how it had been. Why is that? And then for you on this journey, what was your kind of clock or what was the thing that you said to yourself, hey, I've done my time here and now I look somewhere else? Well, look, I mean, so so the role of CMO, I think, has been a really difficult role um, uh, in most companies because there's not alignment, particularly in the C-suite, about what should the CMO do? What is even marketing and what, what should marketing do? And so historically, you could get away with um, running great TV ads, great out of home, some some cool events, and your job is done, right? Because you you've probably had um, some control over manufacturing and some control over distribution. So there are a few players in the marketplace, and all you had to do is remind people who you, who you were. So top of mind awareness, and then you had these uh, these these um, marketing channels and distribution channels that allowed you to dominate uh, um, their mind share. So like, hey, everyone's watching these three channels. Great, we're gonna be, we're gonna, we're gonna dominate our ads on that. Yeah. So your job was done. It was, I won't say it's easy because that was still, you know, anyone's watched the whole Mad Men thing. It's still complicated. You got to tell a story and, and all that. Um, but there was alignment. But then everything changed. It's like, uh, you know what? People don't really want to watch TV ads in the same way. They feel like it's a tax on their experience. Hey, hasn't everything moved to social and digital? So what are you doing in social and digital? And by the way, I can't measure it, all the stuff that you're talking about. Like now I'm in the world of um, you know, you know, CFOs where they're like, hey, you know, I, I want metrics. to understand yeah. metrics. Like tell me, tell, me, tell me how this is actually driving my business. So I think that's the fundamental flaw is that there is a lack of alignment between the, really the CEO and CFO and the CMO. My view on it is, is, is simple, that the role of the chief marketing officer in marketing in general is to drive profitable growth for the firm by changing people's perceptions and their behaviors. That's what we do. Wait, say that line again, I like so that. So drive profitable growth for the firm. So we should, we're a commercial engine. It's about making money, driving transactions, growing things, but you do it by changing the way people perceive things and the way they behave, tapping into that. That's what we do. And if you look at it in that broad sense, then you're, you're, not, you're agnostic. You'll say, okay, can I change someone's perception and behavior by spending all my money on a 30 second TV spot. I can tell you the answer to that is 100% no. Not going to happen on, on any level. Can I actually generate awareness? Maybe, if I'm in live sports, because people are engaged yeah. in that. And so I may spend some money on live sports. But if I look at where people are, where they're interacting, where commerce is increasingly um, happening, where relationships are being built, you better be in social. Yeah. And But when you're in social, every single social platform is like a different country, different language, different symbols, different evangelists, you know, you know, different ritual, different algorithms. It's a different country. And so it's a new way of actually connecting with people. And I think we're in this transition period where you have some marketers who grew up in that old world and they reminisce about, about, that, about that time and want to be a part of it. You have some who grew up in the, in the new space, but they actually don't have necessarily deep knowledge about how do you build ongoing relationships that drive commercial value. Yeah. And so we're in that transition period um, and the best marketers are hybrid, great storytellers who love data, you know, um, people who know how to build relationships, but also know how to create excitement and, and, and energy. We're in that hybrid period, so it's the most exciting time. And so for me, what I looked at always, for me, and, and this is partly from, from the hip hop uh, um, uh, uh, um, ethos, I think, is that I always looked at, num first and foremost, am I in an industry that's changing? You know, I wanted to be in a space where things are changing because if you're in an industry that's changing, everyone's like, we got to make, we got to do something new and different and innovative. And so they don't go to the tried and true. And then am I with a company that actually wants to lead the change? Sometimes they're a disruptor, like a Buzzfeed. Sometimes they're an incumbent and, um, and, but they want to lead the change. They're like, we see the need to change and we want to be in the forefront of that. That's always been the criteria. And then my own deep, deep, deep sense of purpose is if I, do what I can do best within this company. 
am I in some way expanding people's potential and particularly communities that have been underserved? Am I expanding what's possible for them in doing what I do? And so I tried to get all those three, if all those three things come together, I'm extraordinarily happy. Um, um, I feel fulfilled. I'm energized. And, and I think I do great work. And then is the idea that I'm sure the, the science that you have to it is different for other CMOs, but for the most part is the idea though, that when you find that all three of those boxes aren't checked, that maybe at that point, it's not the right fit for you or the company. Both. Yeah. Both. Like, I, you know, I, I don't think I'd be great in a, in a place where it's like, hey, you know what? Um, your brand stewards, just protect the brand. You know, let's move really slowly, uh, deliberately. You can't operate Let, in that. Let's follow what, what happens in the marketplace. We don't really believe that culture drives it. Let's just be right in our category, in our industry real tight. Um, um, I would not thrive in, in that way. I would not be successful. And um, um, so if it leans in the, into that direction or it leans in the direction of we don't want to lead the change, it becomes harder for me because I'm constantly, I'm like you, I'm curious, constantly learning, constantly want to push the envelope, constantly want to innovate and build new things. Yeah, I get that. That's the entrepreneur in you even, or the intrapreneur, which I'm going to start using. And I understand that. It's almost like, you know, KD likes to joke around that a lot of the reasons why he switches teams um, let me be careful with this one. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but this feeling that you have as a kid where you're like, you, your job's done here and you want to take your ball and go somewhere else to play. Now, that probably doesn't relate to every experience he's had. But in, in general, the, the idea was always like to constantly challenge myself. I want to go play on a bigger stage with better players in a better system. I want to keep fine tuning my craft because while it's about team and it's about legacy and all those things are important, when you put so much work into something, you're constantly challenging yourself. So you're fine tuning your own craft. And I would imagine for you, it's gotta be the same way. Like if you feel like you're in autopilot, it's gotta drive you crazy. I, I think that that's, that's so well said. And, and I think what Katie says is, is at the heart of what I, I try to do, uh, which is get better mm -hmm. every single day. I'm always just trying to get, I'm just trying to get better. And, and sometimes I get better by reading. Sometimes I get better by watching a movie. Sometimes I get better by uh, talking to, to different people. Sometimes I get better by repeating things over and over. I'm just constantly trying to get better. As soon as I feel like I'm stagnant, yep. you know, or, you know, there's a game happening at a different level. You know, and you're not there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like they, that was, well, that's where they, the A players are. I yeah. got to get there. I want to get there. I want to be in that game because it allows you to get better. And, um, and, it, and I, I, I think there's only two ways to go. I mean, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. Yep. There is no... I'm remaining neutral because everything else is changing around you, right? So if everything else is changing around you, you're either going to get better or you're going to slowly diminish over, over Without time. Without question. And so I, I think, I hope that I'm a lifelong learner uh, and I hope that I'm constantly energized to figure out ways to get better. And I never want to consider myself an expert. Like someone says, oh, you're an expert. I'm not an expert at anything. I'm, I, I, I approach it with a beginner's mind. Like um, even if I've been in it a long time, if you don't approach it with a beginner's mind, you think you're an expert. You feel like you know everything. As everything is changing around you, your skill in relation to what is possible in the world will diminish. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, you're an expert in traditional media, then all of a sudden social came. What are you going to tell everybody? Exactly right. And then suddenly you're an expert in social, right? You're like, okay, I know uh, Facebook. Yep. Then TikTok comes and changes everything. And you're the boxed algorithm. in. Yep. Exactly. You're boxed in. So let's talk about traditional media for a bit because I, I sometimes I'm confused on why it still costs so much because... The hybrid marketers that know, know that there is room for both, right? I'm pushing a lot of companies we work with to put value back on certain traditional medias because the brand perception or the like uh, for fostering of that brand, continuing to make sure the brand is seen a certain way, used to be the one result you could get from some of this traditional media. But I think that there's creativity, obviously, to traditional media, and you should balance it with the impact you can get from reaching bigger audiences and these like sub communities. But why is it still priced like it was in the 90s? Why is a 30 second commercial and a billboard still priced when we know that the ROI is not what people valued it to be at one point? Because they could stick us up. So <laughs> they have that the only reason. It, make, it makes no sense. It makes, uh, um, if you look across the board right now and you see kind of declining audiences, declining engagement and rising prices, it's either one of two things, right? Either they have, um, I mean, here I want to be careful. They have the strength to do it 
or you have laziness on the other side. Um, but I do make one massive exception. Live sports is different. It's different. You, um, that's where you still have simultaneous viewing. You have people interacting. They're online as well as they are on, you know, on, on the screen. Um, and so that's the one piece I put into a separate category. But once you get outside of live sports, I don't understand it. Yeah. Um, but my hope is this, is that, that this whole idea of traditional media is changing anyway. So the, the, the box on the wall, the screen on, on, the, on the wall um, is becoming increasingly digital. And so you can start to target um, people more effectively. And the question I, I've always asked myself is, how can I move from interrupting people's experience to adding value to their experience? Is there a way for me to do that? And so if you can start to target more effectively and you can produce kind of a much higher volume of content that actually is additive to someone's experience, that to me is, is nirvana. That's when we've hit something. Um, I'm not saying we're there yet, but that's, that's where I think we can go. Um, but the pricing is just out of whack. It's out of whack. Yeah. When you started a company like Visa and you talked about like the scale of the company, uh, what, what is a task for someone of your caliber at a company that size when Visa brings you on, knowing all the experiences you've had, how do you approach when you're dealing with a company of that magnitude, when you know that for you, you said, I want to drive profit, I want to keep the brand identity at a certain level. Is a challenge different when a company is that big? To me, to me, the challenge is really the same. Um, yeah, it's just, it depends on how long the company's been around and how complicated the business is. And the payments business is very complicated. Yeah. And so, you know, my approach has always been, first and foremost, come in, understand the history of the company and the industry in which it, uh, it operates. And so I spent a lot of time early on just understanding the payments uh, um, category. You know, how do we, how do we move from, um, uh, you know, coins and cash into cards like what what happened you know and, and before you had the universal credit card you had these um you know store company cards and you had gas um, company cards but in 1958 they did the drop in fresno suddenly there was a for, um, for visa it was bank america at the time um suddenly you had a card where you can use at a bunch of different places and that was fascinating in and of itself but then i realized that uh, it did something else before that time if you wanted any kind of personal loan you actually had to go into a bank and they would send you downstairs into the basement and you would sit across the table for someone and they would decide whether or not you're worthy of, of a loan. What this car did is it said you can pay it all back within 30 days, but it basically gave you a personal loan without having to go into the bank and have the person across you from you judge you in, in terms of whether you, you can get a loan. And so it opened up that whole, whole aperture. So for me, though, the learning the history, what the logic of, of what was done um, uh, throughout time, that's kind of the first thing. And the second thing I do, I spend a lot of time trying to understand the economics of the business. Like, how is money made? And then the third thing I, um, I try to get my arms wrapped around is, where's it all going? Like, who's nipping at, at, at it? You know, um, why are people, what are the, in our case, fintech companies, you know, um, you know what's happening with, with that? Or what's the next generation of consumers? What are they interested in? How are they behaving? And so if I get those three things, that gets me a large way there. Um, um, the, the other side of it though is relationships because, you know, people think of these companies, these big companies as, you know, this massive faceless, uh, entity, yeah. but it's people inside that are actually making things happen. And if you have good relationships and you have trust, um, that's how things get done. And so it's a combination of kind of having that understanding, historical understanding and the economic understanding, but also building relationships of trust where, where people are willing to kind of mm -hmm. go out on the limb with you. And the relationships and trust internally as a marketer, does it have an effect on the ultimate product and the result of the product? So if you have the chemistry and the culture intact internally from a marketing standpoint, the brand ultimately becomes more sellable. The brand ultimately becomes more attractive just because of the spirit exuding out of this company, no matter how big they are. Do you feel like that has a real impact? It, it, do, it does because, I mean, and you know this, like um, great ideas are, are fragile, yeah. especially in the early stages. And so if you have people who, don't, who are skeptical and don't trust, don't trust you and don't let you take even that half step and they're chipping away at it, by the time the idea is finished, it actually has no impact whatsoever. So having people trust you early on, I think is critical to having great product at the end. 
But the way I think about trust is not just some like abstract idea like, hey, um, do I trust you or not? I think people are asking three things when they say, do um, I trust, trust you? Do you understand me? Empathy. Are you capable? Do you have the skills? And then do you have integrity? Do, you, do your words match your actions? If you got those three things, people tend to trust you. And, 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 um, but you have to have all three. Yeah. Like you can really care about somebody but have no skills at all. Be like, that's the worthless to me. You know what I mean? You can have the skills but don't care about anyone. They're like, well, you're, still, you're out for yourself. Um, you need all three yeah. um, um, to, to make it work. The integrity and pride thing is big. That's, that's something that I feel like, um, I wouldn't say young people challenge or challenged by or compromised by, but I think that it's not as much of a driving force behind young people today as it is for our generation. There was a pride about holding a job. There was a pride about the way in which you did things. Do you think that that's just a reflection of like the world today or do you not even notice it? No, I notice it. I notice it, but I, I don't know the answer to it. I think part of the, I think part of the answer is that um, today that a specific job doesn't define a person as much as it used to. Yeah. Um, and so people are basically saying, Hey, I'm an entrepreneur. So I'm, so I am the brand. I am the job, yeah. you know, or if I'm in a job, it's still me moving to different places. But I want you to recognize my, tr me and my transferable skills and less and less people are saying this job, I am, you know, an employee at this particular uh, uh, company. I'm here forever. The, um, I, I love the association. I take pride in it. It's less and less of that. In order, in my opinion, in order for that to happen, there has to be um, a greater mutuality where large companies, any company actually, are willing to make sacrifices on behalf of the employee. And that's a hard thing to do in this environment. But that's the only way it will change because then it's like, okay, we are in this together to a larger extent. Yeah, you know, um, that's a good you know, point. You know, and they're willing to dig in. It's like, hey, guess what? We didn't have a great year. You know, people at the top may not take as you know, big, big of a bonus, but we're going to make sure we, we take care of our people. That changes things. Yeah. You know? um, and, and you see that at, at some companies. Um, I think we need to see more companies um, have a greater sense of that mutuality. Yeah, it's a good point. The last thing you need are an older generation just complaining about a younger generation, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right, right, That's just not going to benefit anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, last thing I want to talk about is talent. Um, you know, as a CMO, you've been around Pepsi and their big Super Bowl activations. Obviously, you were a part of one of their biggest deals ever. Um, I know you did the same thing with X Factor. Talent used to be picked out of like this small group of people, right? Like you could say, you know, I need uh, one of, the, I have the money for one of the biggest artists in the world. Then you'd go, okay, are we talking to Beyonce? Are we talking to Rihanna? Are we talking to Madonna? Who who it was? Yeah. And in sports, it was the same thing. Yeah. Now you have to really challenge yourself to think about who you're trying to reach and what it is that you're trying to to get out of it. Because some of the talent today can have a massive audience with no engagement, can have no real influence on people. And some of the people that have real influence can be coming from these smaller gaming communities, can be coming from certain sectors, certain sports. And it seems like you've always understood that. You've always had a knack for engaging in the gaming community and sports yeah. and music. Um, you know, I think for a period of the last 10 years, NBA culture felt like it was the most influential before that was hip hop culture for sure. Yeah. And now it's saturated a bit. I think NBA and hip hop still drive a lot of that influence, yeah. but there's people that are building companies that are billion dollar companies now that were influencers. Yeah. So how do you juggle that and think about like timeless talent that you want around your brand and then looking at these creators with these big platforms and these big numbers now for what they can bring to your company. So, so I, I think we're in a moment in time where um, the idea of having a celebrity endorse your product and get your, and, and the brand getting a halo effect from that is minimal. They, I think it's from the most part a waste of time. Like I wouldn't like, even when I was at Pepsi, if you're like, okay, you think someone's going to believe that if I have Beyonce do a drink shot, that they should drink more Pepsi. Yeah. I'm like, you know, we know too much. We know too much. Like they may ask how much did you pay her? You know, um, and so even with the Beyonce, um, um, you know, biggest star in the world, um, and, and even with her, I said, let's not do that. Let's figure out, like, what do you want to do that you cannot do within the current constraints of the industry that you're in? You want to do a documentary? You want to re release a song uh, um, in, in a non-traditional way? You, 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 should we do a movie together? 
So for me, the logic I'm using now uh, and I've used for quite some time now is not so much to get a celebrity or an influencer to um, kind of rub shoulders with the brand. It's to help each other move forward. And so I try to figure out how can I help this artist move forward? And now to do that, you have to look at the industry differently. You have to understand the, the other industry. So like if you're in video gaming, like, so what's happening in video gaming that, that is problematic? Well, game developers don't have the same kind of platform they used to have and the same kind of tools and ability to build and same outlets. Maybe we should be in the game developer world and Exola and, and partner with, with, with them. You know, or from in music, it's not just emerging artists. It's um, artist ability to kind of do non-traditional things. Maybe a big artist doesn't want to do a stadium. Maybe they actually want to go to a special location and do an intimate performance that's never been done before. Yeah. We can fund those kinds of experiences. Maybe they want to be an entrepreneur and they want to go into technology. And so the way I see the brand's role is to, especially Visa and you know, the way we're positioning our brand, is to help people move forward. And that is true of everyday people, but it's also true of, of celebrities and influencers, no matter how big they are. And you know this really well. Yeah. No matter how big you become, there's always some constraint, some wall, some, some box someone has put you in to say, okay, this is where you live. You can't do that. Yeah. And, and, and that artist, that performer, that athlete may want to do that. That's where I think we come in. The brand is playing at the margins of helping people move forward. That's an amazing point because there's uh, there's like a, a secret that they all hold. It's yeah. something else they want to do. 100%. Something else they feel a bit embarrassed to say out loud. And it takes someone that knows how to manage talent and you know how to manage talent to to push that from them and push that out of them. And then all of a sudden the brand wins. That's every exactly time. right. Yep. Exactly right. And they win. And they win. And they win. And it doesn't even matter how successful the actual outcome is. You put them in the game and you gave them every opportunity uh, um, to succeed. That changes that changes people's perception of who you are as as a brand and and, and as an executive. And the last question for me on on the marketing side, um, the physical, uh, the experiences. It felt like, especially during the pandemic, we had lost complete understanding of how important it was to be around people and to experience moments and then what the ripple effect was from that. And obviously you, you know, trusted in us to create a small event in New York city. And I believe that it's those small events, it's those moments that people can actually recall that end up having more of a lasting impact. Have you started to see that shift for you guys as a company and in the market in general about how important the physical moments are again? Yeah. It, so, so first I'm a big believer in, virtual environments. I think it's going to be a fantastic thing. I think it's going to continue to grow. Um, it, it, it will be a universe onto itself. But there's nothing that replaces physical proximity. Like, and maybe one day in, there will in, in the evolution of human, human beings, um, there will be. But right now, there's nothing. Like you can't feel the energy of a person on, on, on the screen. No. I can feel your energy right here. We're sitting yep. right across from each other. We interact in a way that's very different. Um, you know, um, we feed off of, of, of each other in, in that way. You ask any performer, you know, um, what are their best performances? It's when the audience is giving them energy. It's this physical proximity, I think, that's really important. And that's why I actually loved what we did uh, in, the, in the boardroom talks because it was the environment that, we, that you know, it's at the Roxy, so the environment was right. Yeah. You had the right people there, you know, Michael Rubin and, and Lil Baby. Yeah. Um, the conversation was substantive, right? You know, you know, we were really, you know, it wasn't just like, hey, let's hang out. It was a substantive uh, conversation. And then people will kind of engage in that conversation. You can't, at least right now, replicate that. And so for me, I'm a big believer in physical proximity, live in-person e events, but designing it in a way that actually um, allows for real interaction. Yeah. Where things go wrong, is, and, and this is true, I think, of people coming back to the office, is when you just say, like, hey, just be here. And there's not, there's no design experience, no outcome that is expected, no interaction, no yeah. reason, no for reason for us to be connected to each other, um, you know. Um, but I'm very excited about um, the future of live events, proximity, and intimacy. So yeah. I, like I, I'm I'm really like on this smaller is better thing yeah. right right now, um, so that people can really interact. Uh, it more plays so well into the digital behavior too of FOMO. It's straight up. You it know, does. Like, yeah, it, it, it does. Like if you, mm -hmm. if you open it up too wide, you know, people, yeah. yeah, I was there too. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, you're a hundred percent right though on, you know, having to tell people why, because like we said earlier, they know too much, you know, and that's the, 
the divide with young people is if you don't meet them and say, hey, I need you here for this reason, you can no longer tell someone to just be here. Because that's right. they already know that that's not the answer. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, well, Frank, as I imagined it would be, I've learned a lot, my friend. Thank you very much. It's an amazing point in your career and your life, too, because you still are so much in touch, in the mix. You're kind of in that hybrid time where you understand the old, you understand the new, and I'm excited to see what's next for you. Man, I'm, I'm excited, period, man. And I always love talking to you, Rich, man. It's always a great conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing, tuning in. Frank Cooper, Visa, Boardroom. See you all soon.